now we're going to get real weird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'm going to relate it to something that hopefully you should, you should be familiar with. So the, the topic of this conversation, and maybe this is a good place to kind of split things up if we're going to do part one, part two, um, is we're going to talk about VRFs. Virtual route forwarding instances. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the name of the game here is VRFs. Layer two, layer three, doesn't matter VRF. So we're, we're working with VRFs. We're working on exchanging routes in VRFs. We're putting routes into VRFs, et cetera. Um, but they're going to be used in a different way than you're probably familiar with. Uh, another little side note, I'm going to be using, I'm going to be saying it as VRF and as VRF. I know that might drive some people crazy, but um, depending on how, it, what's in front of it and what's after it, sometimes it's just easier to say VRF because there's a lot of syllables. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with VRF, yeah. Okay. I, uh, if you said e-grip, uh, I had a friend who said e-grip. I, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't know about that one. But VRF, <laughs> I'm good with VRF personally, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to be using them both interchangeably. So when I say VRF or VRF, it's the same thing. Just don't, um, don't say so MIPLs. I had to throw that out there. MPLS is not, <laughs> not MIPLs. Can't, MIPLs. We can't do that. No. Okay. No. Yeah. We're not, we're not going to talk about MPLS. <laughs> All right. So um, what do you know about it? Describe to me what a VRF is. Uh, to me, a virtual route forwarding instance is a, I, I would describe it as a separate unique memory space with its unique route forwarding table, I would assign interfaces into a specific VRF that participate in a routing scheme for that that VRF. So if I've got interface uh, gig01 and it's a member of uh, VRF1, if for to exchange routes with something else, um, that other interface would need to be a member of that VRF in the same device as well. Things in a different VRF, those routes that are learned in that other VRF don't collide unless you leak between the VRFs in some way. They're meant to be completely separate uh, routing tables. That, that's how I think of them. Okay, yep. And perhaps even simpler, they're just separate routing instances that can have overlapping IP addresses. So I can have the same IP address in one yeah. as I have in the other. So I've got red. Um, it's got 10111 as an interface, and blue's got 10111. Yeah, I, I buried the lead. I buried the lead, Tony. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you can have uh, these multiple address spaces exist, uh, coexist, but be separate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, and um, so they don't interfere with each other, and it's a, it's a forwarding space. Discre it's a discrete forwarding space. Let's let's use those terms, discrete forwarding space, because it's like going it. to get. And we typically have think of it as an IP space, but I think you you start to see I'm hinting that we're not talking. We're not, we can use it for other things. Yes, not not merely IPs, even though that's perhaps the most common use case that we think of, right? Yeah, and then we configure them in like a Cisco Arista device. It'll be like IP VRF instance whatever syntax, red, and then another one for blue. We declare them, and then it sets up a separate forwarding table on each device. Let's say I've done the same configuration on both devices. This little tool is very handy for this purpose. And I want to exchange routes between device one and device two. They could be router switches, whatever, doesn't matter. But I want to exchange routes between the two. Our routing protocols typically do not take, do not have a concept of a VRF. Which was going back to my point about interfaces where you got to assign them and be careful how you're plugging things in if you want the VRFs to exchange and stay isolated. Right. So that would be something like VRF Lite uh, between devices. But yeah. what if we only had one link? Mm -hmm. We only had one link in order to exchange routes between these two VRFs. Uh, targets, what tools do we have? Route targets and route distinguishers, right? Yeah. So we, what a route distinguisher we use to, um, you know, the, the difference between route targets and route distinguishers is a very confusing one because they look exactly the same. They're the same format for the most part. Um, but they have two very different purposes. The route distinguisher is not as important to what we're talking about. The route distinguisher just makes sure that when a route goes into the network, 
route goes into the routing table, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stretch this out a little bit here. And I'll just this is going to be our there may be multiple other devices around, and that's just going to represent how we're exchanging routes across different peering sessions, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So when we take this particular route and we put it into the global routing table, mm -hmm. exchange it with multiple devices that and again, the routing protocols don't have VRFs you know, don't natively know what a VRF is. They just exchange routes, and that route is there. And then we have this route. Oops. We put that route in. Now they collide. Mm -hmm. When they go to the other device, we don't know where to put it. Or we actually, so we, we don't want them to collide, so we put a route distinguisher on them. Um, so it's got a route distinguisher. And it might be something like... We'll use the IP address of maybe loopback zero, and then um, something else as an as a. But th some metadata that goes along with the route, so that when it moves to a new device, the new device knows, oh, this belongs to this VRF. Right, and the route distinguisher doesn't do anything else other than make it a unique route in the routing table. That's all it does. It doesn't determine where we send anything or where anything goes or where the route is accepted or not accepted or what VRF the route is put into. All it does is just make it uh, unique in the routing table and when we're exchanging routes from multiple different forwarding spaces. That's all it does. In fact, when the router, when the receiving router sees it, it just throws a route, you know, it makes a note of it, it will put it in the routing table. If you do show up your route, you'll, you know, you can see it in there. But it doesn't do anything with it, it doesn't care. Like if I'm a router and I've, here's a route, it's route distinguisher, is the receiving router is like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't care. That's what the route target is for. The route target is a little bit of metadata that we use to uh, we have to build maps on every one of our devices that says, uh, so um, forget about the route distinguishers for now. Because again, they're not very important. Well, they're not as important probably as the route targets. So red, we're going to put a route target on it as um, 10, 10. And then blue, we're going to put a route target on as 20, 20. And then we're going to have an import and export statement, typically, so that when we import a route and when we export a route, what is the tag we're looking for and what's the tag we're going to throw on that? It's not like an VLAN tag or anything, but what's the route RT we're going to put on it? What's the RT we're looking for? So the, the route distinguisher so keeps them separate within when they're in a common routing space. The route, uh, mm -hmm. the route target says, hey, when you get this route, this is where it needs to go. This is the VRF it needs to end up in. Am I right? right. Is that right? Okay. It's been a while yes, since I've thought about this, so right. this, is, this is a good refresher for yeah. me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and one of the things, you know, one of the, the, the frustrating things when I was learning EVPN is that I think this was kind of skipped over. It was just, it was like a couple of lines in a lot of the books or whatever hmm. uh, in classes. So, but understanding this is critically important. If you don't get this concept, it's going to be very difficult for you to troubleshoot EVPN. Because hmm. this is where a lot of the stuff happens, a lot of the misconfigurations happen, and this is where the troubleshooting happens is route targets. Because route distinguishers are hard to mess up. Well, I, it may be a lack of imagination on my part in how, <laughs> you know, getting the route distinguisher wrong. Right. Um, I, I did actually, I did have a problem that I had to troubleshoot and it was because I did not put a route distinguisher on. So weird things happen when you don't put an RD on. Um, but RTs will make things completely not work. So, We've got a route targets. We have the import and ex export statements. So the export statement means that when this forwarding space, I'm announcing a route, I'm going to throw this on. I'm going to throw that 1010 on. Mm -hmm. So I'll put it into the routing table with that 1010 in there. So that's my export statement. 
my import statement is when I get a route and it's got a route target on it, I look at the route target and it matches my import statement and then I throw it into that particular forwarding space. Yep, gotcha. So um, the route distinguishers don't need to match between devices, but the route targets absolutely do need to match. Got it, okay. In fact, the route distinguishers almost never match, and that's another way that we can tell where a route came from, like where the origination of it was. So we typically will use the loopback interface as the route distinguisher so that I know, oh yeah, this came from leaf 4. It, it, so if you're using IBGP and you, can, you don't have the AS number to tell where the route came from, we can use the route distinguisher if you configure it that way.